Concordia University is pleased to have as its 2014 commencement speaker, Mr. Ben Utecht. Ben has been a successful football player at the University of Minnesota and for the National Football League with the Indianapolis Colts and the Cincinnati Bengals. Although his career was cut short to injury, he did win a Super Bowl ring with the Indianapolis Colts in 2005. Now he is vigorously embracing his new career in music and public speaking. Ben is releasing his fourth album and his Christmas album was nominated for a Dove Award. He and his wife, Karen, are parents of three beautiful daughters, something I know a little bit about. Please welcome Mr. Ben Utecht. Thank you. All right, how you doing? Good? You excited? It's a long stage. A lot of opportunities to fall right on your face, right here. It could happen. So excited to be here. Thank you so much, uh, President Reese, for the invitation. It, for those of you that where it would be easy to stand, could you all just stand for me just for one moment? Just I know, just bear with me. Everyone, graduates too, everybody, just, just, I know, just bear with me, stand for just a second. I've got to tell you, I, I'm a PK, I'm a pastor's kid, and I have always wanted to do this. You may be seated. <laughs> yeah. Y'all aren't as smart as uh, your diplomas say on that one, but no. You know what, guys, uh, this is, uh, at 32 years old, I never thought that I would say that I'm starting to feel old, but it's been 11 years since I was in your position. And uh, my wife and I were talking on the way up just about the memories of going through this time and how important it is and how special it is and how it's life-altering and life-changing for so many of you. Uh, one in particular, Zach, where are you? Zach Moore. Zach, congratulations, man. Uh, just so you all know, Zach Moore is, is just about to head into the NFL, and I wish I was there because we would have met as a tight end, as a defensive end. So, uh, congrats, Zach. In fact, you better be careful because I might, I might get in your way up here just to see what you got. I mean, let's do this. Let's do this. I'm not afraid. <laughs> uh, you know, it's been, it's been a crazy time for us. We're in a, we're in a really unique uh, time in our lives. We have three beautiful daughters. We had three daughters ages two and under. Okay? Let me say that again. Two and under. Okay, we were surprised with identical twin girls. And uh, we call it beautiful chaos. It has been, it, it is crazy. Just a man, parents. So all the parents, th these are your babies, Okay. Do you remember what these babies did to their diapers when they were growing up? I mean, it, it okay, we, we are in this period in our lives right now where we've had to potty train these three girls all at the same time, and I can't describe to you what it's like to have one running around the kitchen going to the bathroom, one of the twins is on the stairs going to the bathroom, the other is on the couch, but the one on the couch and the one on the stairs look exactly alike, so I have no idea which one I'm talking to when I'm trying to teach them. So it is beautiful chaos, and we love being parents. So let me begin and try and put things uh, into focus for you. It was February of 2007, and I was about to step onto the biggest stage in the world. 110 million people tuned in to the Super Bowl that year to watch the Indianapolis Colts face off against the, uh, the Chicago Bears. Are there any Bears fans here? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. No. <laughs> it, was, it, it, it was such a special night uh, uh, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, one in particular was the first time in the history of the NFL where two African-American coaches uh, had come to the place in their careers where they were facing each other in the world championship game. It was also 
one of the only games to ever rain in the Super Bowl. Okay? Now, when you're losing in the rain, it sucks. But when you are winning in the rain, it gets so much better. It was such an amazing moment, and I'll never forget it. In fact, two weeks before we left to go to Miami, our all-pro kicker, Adam Vinatieri, a future Hall of Famer, got up in front of the team because he had won, already won three Super Bowls with, the, uh, with the, the New England Patriots. And so he was giving us some insight as to what we were about to face. And he said, he said guys, I, I want to tell you something. At kickoff, don't blink. Don't you dare blink. Don't blink for a moment. And that was the one thing that stuck with me. So here I am. I'm on the sidelines. Okay, I'm standing right in between Coach Tony Dungy and, in my opinion, the greatest quarterback of all time, Peyton Manning. And I'm seeing Adam as he's counting off his steps, preparing to go and kick the ball. And I remembered what he said, don't blink, not even once. So in the cool mist of a February in Miami, the whistle blows and Adam approaches the ball and he lays into it. His foot hit the ball perfectly and it came off the tee and it was soaring. And I began to understand what Adam was talking about because at that moment I have never seen so many flashing lights. Every single camera was out and being used and it truly felt like I was on the television show Dancing with the Stars. I mean, all around, 360 degrees, covered in flashing lights. And then I'll never forget the moment where I caught the ball coming back down out of those lights into the hands of the most dangerous return man in all of football, Devin Hester. And Devin ran it past the 10, and then the 20, and then the 30, and then past the 50, and the 40, and the 20, and he crossed the goal line on the very first play. And in that moment, it went from being the greatest experience of my life to the worst experience <laughs> of my life. Now, what do you think happened to me at that moment? What do you think filled me at that moment? If I'm being completely honest with you, I would tell you that it was fear. It was fear. I found myself in, in one moment, even though I had spent my whole life preparing for this, I found myself in one moment afraid that this had all of a sudden began to begun to foreshadow what was to be a losing experience. And once fear had a grip on my heart, the doubt crept in. And the lies that you're going to fail. And you're going to make mistakes. In my opinion, fear is one of the most destructive hidden diseases for mankind. Why? Because it cripples the soul. It can take from you the very essence of what makes you human, that you were created for a purpose, and that each of you are uniquely relevant in this world. Now we all know that's not the truth. And we all know the negative effect that fear can have on our lives. Now what is the truth? Okay, because the lie of fear does tell us that we can't do it that you're not good enough, that we will fail. And that's what I was feeling on the sidelines. And I'm sure that's what many of you over the course of the last four years have felt and maybe are feeling right now as you're about to step out into the real world. Well, as a pastor's son, I always go to where I know the truth is, and that's the Word of God. And this is what it says, 2 Timothy 1.7, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power 
and of love and of a sound mind. I found a a quote also from Marcus Aurelius, Emperor of Rome, from 161 to 180, and he said this. If you are distressed by anything external, if you fear anything external, the pain is not due to the thing itself, but to your estimate of it. And this you have the power to revoke at any moment. And that's exactly what I was struggling with on that sideline. Okay, I was so consumed with, with the, the celebration that was happening in, in our end zone that I lost the reasoning to understand that, that I can overcome this. I'm reading a book right now called In the Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day. It's kind of an odd title, isn't it? In the Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day. It tells the story of a Moabite warrior in the Old Testament whose name was Benaiah. Now let me read to you Benaiah's story. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was a valiant man of Kabzeel, a doer of great deeds. He struck down two warriors of Moab. He also went and struck down a lion in a pit on a day when the snow had fallen. These things did Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and won the name beside the three mighty men of David. He was renowned among the thirty, and David set him over his personal bodyguard. Now there are a couple of things that jump out at me here. Can you imagine? Can you imagine choosing to jump into a pit with a lion, with only your spear, and to kill it? Are you kidding me right now? I mean, I'm, I'm stressing out about a football game where we're throwing around a blown up piece of pigskin, okay? And yet, this young warrior faces a lion on a snowy day. Which in Minnesota, I mean, if Benai grew up in Minnesota, it wouldn't be no big deal, but can you imagine can you imagine? Can you imagine the opportunities that fear had to penetrate into the soul of Benaiah? But he understood what Marcus Aurelius was talking about. He understood that he had the power and the love and the sound mind to take hold of that fear and extinguish it. And what happens to him when he chooses to be a lion chaser, when he chooses to be a risk taker, when he chooses to pursue victory in boldness and in courage. He's elevated. Success follows those choices. And I find it fascinating because he had no idea that when he jumped into that pit, that King David, the most powerful king in the world at that time, would call upon him to be, to be his personal bodyguard. And it got better for him. He continued to lead in that manner. And when King David's son, King Solomon, who became the most wise and wealthy king in the world at that time, when he became king, he elevated Benaiah once again to the general over all of his army. Because Benaiah, years later, looked fear in the face and said, you're not welcome here. Going back to the sidelines. So there I was, standing between Tony Dungy and Peyton Manning. Now what do you think their reaction to Devin Hester scoring on the first play of the game was. Fearless. I came back after looking at that celebration and all those feelings creeping in, in in just a moment, and I came back to seeing my head coach not even paying attention. He didn't even give Devin Hester a time of day. He was looking at his play sheet, he was talking to his coaches, 
preparing for our offense to go take the field. And I look over and I see Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning's talking to Jeff Saturday and the rest of the offensive line. He's getting the guys ready. He's not even paying attention to what's going on. He's looking at his wristband. He's talking to Tom Moore, the offensive coordinator. And in that moment, I regained what had been taken from me. Because I saw the example of it. Two fearless men who lead with courage and who lead with boldness. And I knew, I just knew at that moment, I don't know how to describe it, just a peace came over me, the fear went away, and I knew we were going to go win the game. And I had my own Benaya moment later in that game. It's probably one of my favorite parts about the Super Bowl. We were in the third quarter, and the game was close, and we needed to take the lead to get the momentum back. I'll never forget this. It was third and eight. If we get this first down, we get into the red zone, so at the least, we will kick a field goal. This was a big third down. And I've lined up in the backfield, in the running back position, to the left of Peyton Manning. The rain at, at this point is coming down really hard, makes it very difficult to catch a ball. But in that moment, Peyton leaned over to me and he said, Tech, he called me Tech. He said, Tech, this one's coming to you. You have to get it. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I can't believe that he did that to me. But I had, a, I had an opportunity here, you guys. The same one that all of you have when you walk out these doors tonight. I had an opportunity. Was I going to choose to be a lion chaser like Benaiah? Or was I going to allow that fear to creep into my heart and potentially steal what was about to be given to me? And so I lined up to, next to Peyton. Peyton is a great communicator. If any of you have watched the games, you see him. He's doing all the hand signals and he's doing all the talking. And it's all real. It's all real communication. And, and, and he leans over to me and he, and he says, all right, they're, gonna, they're, they're, they're faking the blitz. They're faking the blitz. And sure enough, uh, there are two Pro Bowl linebackers, Brian Erlacher, standing 6'5", 265 pounds, okay, about the size of Zach Moore, except he's a middle linebacker. He okay, runs a 4 5 40. That doesn't mean anything to you, but it means something to me, and that's fast. Okay? Sure enough, he comes up into the A gap, and I'm standing right next to Peyton, and he says, it's, it, he says They're going to fake the blitz. They're going to fake the blitz. Get open. Sure enough, the ball is snapped, and the linebackers fake the blitz. They drop back into zone coverage. An opening appears between the center and the left guard that I'm just able to sneak through. I jump over both of their legs, which are crossed. I get up to my five-yard point, stick my foot in the ground, and turn to see that Peyton had already released the ball. I put my hands up, and I made the catch. And I pulled it in. And I turned back around with the longest four yards that I've ever had to get. And who do you think was staring me down like a lion in a pit? On a rainy day, Brian Erlacher. And I swear to this day he had red eyes. I'm kidding, I kid you not. <laughs> I kid you not. But I had, a, I had a choice. I knew it wasn't gonna feel good. I knew it was gonna hurt. But I also know, knew that we had to get into the red zone to put points on the board. And so I made a choice right there that I was gonna be a lion chaser. And that I was going to destroy fear. That I was going to use my shoulder to wipe it out. And so I put my feet in the ground as hard as I could. I ran as fast as I could. And I lowered my shoulder into the chest of Brian Erlacher and pushed him back and got the first down. And we, yeah, come on. Can I get an amen? But I have to tell you, I, it was, that, it, it, it was a pivotal time for me in my career as an athlete because when you continue to stand over fear, when you continue to beat it down, it begins to leave. And it allows you to reach your potential. 
Our team went on to, to win the game 29 to 17, and we became world champions. In closing tonight, I, all of you graduates here tonight are standing on the sidelines. And life is the playing field. At any moment, the whistle is going to blow and the game will begin. Now, you have all put in the hard work and you're ready to compete. How you choose to step on that field and enter the game will set the tone for the rest of your lives. That's an exciting thing. Because you choose it. My question for you tonight, class of 2014, is this. Will you choose to be lion chasers? Will you pick up your spear and jump into the pit of this world and with boldness strike down fear? I have no doubt that if you make that choice tonight, each and every one of you will go out and change the world. Seize your relevance. Seize your purpose with boldness. And even though we don't know each other, listen to me very, very closely, because I care about you. You were all created to do something great, each and every one of you. And what you're about to do on this stage, very few people do. You're all champions. Believe in yourself. Walk out that door onto the game of life and win. Go slay the lion. Thank you.